On this edition of Native Report, we take a tour of a very special sculpture garden of the Mohegan Nation in Uncasville, Connecticut. While in Connecticut, we visit the Tantaquegian Indian Museum, the oldest Native American owned and operated museum in the United States. And we visit the Peabody Museum at Harvard University and learn about the archeology span and history of the Indian College at Colonial Harvard. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Visitors to the Mohegan Nation Government and Community Center are greeted by life-size statues that honor prominent sachems and chiefs. Join us as we learn about their place in Mohegan history. A gentle wind blows across the statue garden on Crow Hill of the Mohegan Indian Reservation. These statues in front of the Mohegan Government and Community Center are memorials honoring the influential Mohegan chiefs and sachems of the 20th century. Behind me we have two very important chiefs. The man with the hat was Henry Wiegand Matthews. And Wiegand means good in our language, and that was something that his people called him because he was so pure of heart. And we see him actually grinding corn. Corn, we believe, feeds the body and the spirit. We call it, we watch him, but when it's ground, we call it yokiag, which means traveling food. Uh, traveling food has, has many purposes, mainly for hunters on long journeys, but also it's very important to nourish us spiritually. And so this is something he did. He, he kept us going during very difficult times and uh, provided for his people, both physically and spiritually. Behind him, we have Chief Mataga, and Chief Mataga's English name is Burl Fielding, and Burl Fielding was a great preserver of our ceremonies and kept our wigwam festival going. Our wigwam festival is actually like a powwow where we invite the whole world to come visit us every year in August on the third weekend in August and Chief Mataga would cook in the cook shack and make the clam chowder and the oyster stew and wake everyone up early in the morning to make sure that things got going as they needed to. And he also held the tribe together during the difficult period of the 1930s and 40s and into the 1950s. Melissa is the Mohegan Nation's tribal historian and medicine woman. One of her responsibilities is to tell the stories of the tribal chiefs honored in this special place. I'm standing in front of a good friend of mine, Cortland Fowler. He was our chief and chairman during the 1970s, 1980s, into the 1990s. And he was a very traditional man, but he also was very political and very resolute. He was the person who was in charge of our people at the time of our first filing of federal recognition. And he went through the period in which we were initially denied that claim and had to keep things going through that time when, of course, there was a, a lot of discontent and unhappiness on the part of the tribe. He's pictured in his statue here with a headdress that was the type that was worn a lot by Eastern Indian men in his period because it was very flamboyant, it garnered a lot of attention, but he also wore traditional roach in many of his pictures. You'll see him wearing a, a split deer tail and porcupine headdress. Uh, his regalia is typical of, of the other men you see here with Eastern Woodlands designs. And he's carrying a hatchet because his Indian name was Little Hatchet. And the reason for that is that as a young boy, he always wanted to chop wood. So his father had to get him a very small hatchet when he was just a little boy and his hatchet grew with him. He was someone who worked very, very hard with these people in his, in his own time. Of course, there was no salary. This was just something that, that he did and devoted himself to. He was also a great proponent of protecting our burial grounds. 
he made sure that those things were taken care of. And in fact, uh, several of the burial grounds which we have been able to reclaim were due to his hard work, uh, places where you know, local authorities had paved over burial grounds and that sort of thing. Thanks to Cortland Fowler, we were able to reclaim those places. My favorite thing about Cortland Fowler was his stubbornness. He was stubborn in a time where that's all we had was to hang on and hold on and say no to people who were trying to harm our burial grounds, do things to our people that were unfair. Uh, sometimes people might have seen him as gruff and I saw him as resolute and I was proud to call him my friend. It was in 1994 under the leadership of Chief Ralph Sturges when the Mohegan Nation received federal recognition. The man standing behind me is Chief Gatinamog, which means he who helps you, Ralph Sturgis. And certainly he did do that. Uh, when he became chairman of our tribe, we were not a federally recognized Indian nation. And when he finished his tenure, we had been a federally recognized Indian nation for many years. And pretty much all of his dreams and our dreams were starting to come true in terms of bringing our people home. Uh, this community center that we're standing near was his idea. He said, this is the first thing we have to do for our people. We have to have a place we can gather again. Ralph Sturgis dedicated himself 100% to federal recognition. Uh, it was something that he, I think more than anyone else, understood in terms of how much it would benefit our people. Uh, some of the things in, in the East that sometimes people don't realize are that Indians can go very unnoticed here in New England. Uh, we were fortunate. We had a museum and we still have a museum. So we had some sort of a public face, but many tribes don't have that. And our reservations are very hidden. Uh, they're in the woods and a lot of people don't even know they're there. Uh, they're, in Connecticut, there are five Indian reservations and very few people could tell you where those are. So Ralph Sturgis worked on federal recognition and we succeeded in, in that goal in 1994. Uh, he's pictured here holding the paper in which our land is returned to us by the federal government, and that was a very important part of federal recognition. And he wore a baseball cap that said Chief on it. That was one of his, his favorite things that, that, that he had. Uh, he sometimes wore a headdress, but the baseball cap was something you saw him in most of the time. Uh, he sometimes called himself a three-piece suit Indian because he had to travel to Washington, D.C. a lot. And uh, he had a very affable personality, and I think that's one of the reasons that he was so successful. These are the people who brought us where we are today. I'm Dr. Arnie Vanio, and today we'll be talking about heart disease and cardiovascular disease. Heart disease affects a big portion of the population and is responsible for about 610,000 deaths in the United States each year. Heart disease includes coronary artery disease, hypertension or high blood pressure, heart attacks, congestive heart failure, heart rhythm problems, and congenital heart disease. Cardiovascular disease can also involve the heart and is caused by narrowed, blocked, or stiffened blood vessels that prevent blood and oxygen getting to your heart, brain, or other organs. When it comes to heart disease symptoms, men are more likely to have chest pain, while women can sometimes have just extreme fatigue, nausea, and shortness of breath and this can sometimes be missed. Other symptoms can include pain in the jaw, throat, upper abdomen, or back. You may not be diagnosed with cardiovascular disease until after you have a heart attack, heart failure, stroke, or develop angina. Angina is chest pain that goes away with rest, and the pain is usually squeezing, pressure, tightness, or heaviness. Pain that does not go away with rest or nitroglycerin could be a heart attack and needs to be evaluated in the emergency room. A heart attack is a blockage in a blood vessel to the heart muscle itself, and that part of the heart dies. The heart muscle can heal as a scar in about eight weeks, then that part of the heart doesn't contract and cannot pump anymore. Treatment for heart attacks is often cardiac rehab and lifestyle changes, and can include angioplasty, which is a thin balloon to push the artery open again. Stents can be used to keep the blood vessel open. Sometimes people need to have coronary artery bypass graft surgery to jump around the blocked areas. There are three main blood vessels that supply blood to the heart muscle itself, and each supplies a specific part of the heart. Preventing heart disease is much better than trying to fix it after heart damage happens. The best way to prevent heart disease, regular exercise, 
a low-fat diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, losing weight, and avoiding alcohol and non-ceremonial tobacco use. Controlling blood pressure allows your heart to work less hard, and keeping diabetes under control helps prevent damage to blood vessels. There are many different types of heart problems, and we'll discuss those individually in future segments. As always, please email me questions you would like to have answered here. My email address is at the bottom of the screen. Remember, call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arne Vainio, and this is Health Matters. The Tantanquijan Indian Museum is the oldest Native American-owned museum in the United States. Operated by the Mohegan Tribe of Connecticut, the museum houses a collection of artifacts and objects from across the continent. This stone lodge on the Mohegan Indian Reservation is the Tantanquijan Indian Museum, which houses a collection of Mohegan and other Native American artifacts. It is dedicated to the ideal of education. Welcome to the Tanaquidgen Museum. It was built in 1931 by John and Harold Tanaquidgen. They um, had housed a lot of these articles that are in this museum in their home, and so they decided they wanted to build a museum and present their viewpoints to the public so they would get to know them better. And it was a good thing they did because two years after they moved all the articles up here, their house burnt down. This particular room houses Mohegan items for the most part. We also have some Mohegans and um, northern um, coastal Indian items in that one. And the other room is what we call the Southwest Room, and it houses items from the West, Southwest, and some South American items. This is what we call our um, leaders board, um, sort of, and there's a lot of chiefs up here and important people to our tribes, including women. Um, they were all artisans. Um, some of the carvings, this one particular one, I was mentioning the fire. Um, my grandfather had saved one of the beams from that and carved this and donated this to the museum. He also did some beadwork. Um, this was from Chief Mataga. He did um, a lot of utensils and these were typical wedding presents that they would present to the brides. Looking at these items, it reminds me of the way things used to be. Um, we've changed so rapidly with the um, onset of the gaming that things have just progressed. Um, this reminds me of the old times when you would sit around and you would actually have conversations with people and you know do crafts together. Obviously my grandfather's items are very important to me too because he's actually, these earrings came from my father who got his education about beating from my grandfather so it's all connected somehow. The Mohegan hold their chiefs and sachems in high regard. A statue garden honors their memory. The medicine women also hold a special place in Mohegan culture. In one corner of the lodge stands a wood carving in the likeness of Gladys Tanta Quidgen, co-founder of the museum. I'm standing in front of my great aunt, Gladys Tanta Quidgen, who lived from 1899 to 2005. She was 106 when she passed on and she led her people through most of the 20th century as a medicine woman and also uh, as a member of the tribal council in, in, in many different capacities. She learned from her traditional elders. When she was a small child, she was selected. They actually called her everyone's grandmother, uh, Nana Skidenbach, because she was the type of child who really captured the imagination of the older people. Uh, and they felt that she would do great things. The carving of Gladys is really an interesting piece. It's made of a single piece of basswood, which is a sacred tree to us. It's called Week Up in our language because it's a cure-all. It heals, which is in many ways what Gladys herself was like. She was a, a healing kind of a personality, a good-spirited person. Gladys' belt is a very interesting piece. It comes from a time before the American Revolution. And what's interesting about it is it was only worn by three women. They had such longevity. Martha Uncas passed it on to Fidelia Fielding. These are Mohegan women. Fidelia Fielding's Indian name was Flying Bird, and Flying Bird passed it on to Gladys. And so Gladys died in 2005, and this belt, which was only owned by three women, came into existence in 1769. So with it went many of our stories with the belt, and that's why it's such an important piece of our culture. Gladys is holding a small basket, which also has significance because it relates to offerings that we give to some of the spirits who are important to us. And her clothing, again, is, is Eastern woodland design. She's a tiny, tiny lady. In the yard adjacent to the museum is a replicated Mohegan village that features a traditionally framed wigwam and longhouse. 
This longhouse in a wigwam, longhouse tended to have two or three families. In this area, they could be up to 60 feet long and house up to 12 families. Every family had their own fire pot and their own beds. They're made out of poplar, which is the outside bark, and the inside structure is swamp cedar. And they take the saplings and they have to dig down. Then you bend those saplings, cross them over, tie them together, so then you have that structure that you attach the bark to, and then the outer rings hold the bark into place. Um, they're very well made. Um, in the summertime, they're very cool. If you put the mats on the inside, it's like air conditioning with the air circulating. And in the winter, that's just like you're having heating in your house and it keeps the wigwams warm. I think this village adds a lot because now we have an outside attraction as well. And a lot of people don't even come into the museum. They will just come and look around the village and sit up here. We're on Mohegan Hill. Um, a lot of the Mohegans lived in this area. Um, that were, you know, it was not just on this area, but in this general area, this is where we all lived. I lived across the street, and like I said, my grandfather lived on the other side of the museum. So every day I would walk through this path to go to my grandfather's or my grandmother's house. And Harold or Gladys or Ruth would grab me every single day and show me something, you know, that was related to something in here. So this is what we have. You can't just replace any of these items. So it's our heritage and our culture. What these people have just done is uh, reenacted uh, this march back in November 7th through the 13th, 1862, when 1,700 of our people, primarily women and children, were force marched 150 miles from southwestern Minnesota around the Morton Redwood Falls area, 150 miles to the concentration camp. And again, soldiers enforced this. We just got done there with that little ceremony where a lot of us were carrying like a twig with a, well, like a branch, I guess, with uh, ribbons on it. And on those, on the ribbons was names of known people who were on that march. And, uh, and the, the young people who are running it, they were very thoughtful and they knew that one of my relatives was Haza Wee. Her name, and that means in English, blueberry woman. And uh, they gave me her that that uh, branch with the with a name with a ribbon on it to carry, and then in the circle we were to put it down. And uh, anyway, uh, when I put it down, I just said, "Kunshi Azawi, Wopi Tonka, Echichiado." Tears came to my eyes. I said, you know, Hazaway, Blueberry Woman, thank you so much for what you have done. In 2007 and 2009, Harvard students, professors, and leaders of local Native communities shared the excitement of discovery and interpretation as they excavated Old Harvard Yard, site of the Indian College. The small fragments they found revealed so much from a time long ago. One of the world's oldest archaeological and ethnographic museums is the Peabody Museum on the Harvard University campus. Today, we will learn about the Digging Veritas exhibit that reveals how students lived at Colonial Harvard and the role of the Indian College in the school's early years. Harvard's founded in 1636 with the goal of educating English students to become Puritan ministers. So it's a Puritan institution as it's initially founded. Unlike the Harvard you know today, which is kind of a grander institution, Harvard in the 17th century is a poor, financially struggling institution and actually starts to go bankrupt. So they seek funding from the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in New England to help them keep the university going. Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in New England is looking as part of their colonization efforts to convert Native Americans in Southern New England to become Puritans. 
one way they seek to do that at Harvard is establish the Indian College. So what that means in 1650 is that Harvard reestablishes itself to the education, and I'm quoting directly from the 1650 Harvard Charter, the education of English and Indian youth of this country in knowledge and godliness. And one way to proselytize and convert a population was through language and language acquisition, both um, Native American knowledge of English language and vice versa, English knowledge of Native American languages. So 1655, the Indian College um, building is constructed, and there are only actually a few Native American students that come to Harvard between 1655 and about 1690. Harvard Yard had been excavated during the 1980s. However, the 2005 excavation coincided with the 350th anniversary of the Indian College. In 2005, the Harvard University Native American program organized the commemoration of the 350th anniversary of the Indian College. It was a fantastic event with scholars and celebration across campus. Here at the Peabody Museum, we have an exhibit, a student-curated exhibit called Digging Veritas, which tells the story of the Indian College. So we have um, the archival information of what the plans were, that it was to be built of brick, that it was supposed to have certain dimensions, and it's supposed to have two chimneys and several chambers. So we have that information. There are no maps from the 17th century of Harvard. There's no architectural plans. There's no really complete description, it's just these notes in the records that we find. We've located a foundation trench for the Indian College building. So going from where we really didn't know where the Indian College building was to actually finding part of the, its foundation trench in the soil has been great. But then to locate printing type, that type that was used in the printing press that was used for the printing of those books in Algonquin, we found the printing type inside the foundation trench where the Indian College was. That just brought it all around. You know, we have a sense of things from the archival records, but the archaeology really gives us a different sense what their day-to-day -day was like. What we find is trash, you know, the stuff that's left behind. And that trash tells us how they ate, what they ate, you know, how they studied, what they smoked, what they drank. And that's a fascinating story because it tells us the community that they created as students, both the English and Indian students together here at Harvard. And that story of the Indian College is what faculty and staff strongly believes needs to be told to a larger audience. Peabody Museum has focused specifically on the history of Harvard, on the Indian College, has looked at the charter. And with the help of quite a few faculty and alumni, you know, they've been able to shine a very, very big spotlight on the Indian College and the history of the Indian College at Harvard. This is a very, very unique history. Harvard as the first institution of higher education in the United States and the first to then also be there to educate Native youth or, you know, have um, part of its um, purpose to educate Native youth. It's one of those things where not too many people know that, especially students who come here. They really had no idea that this is what the um, history of their institution is. You know, the dig in Harvard Yard was kind of the most uh, in your face pointing back to this history because nobody puts a big hole in Harvard Yard. That doesn't happen. All of a sudden students, uh, tourists, faculty, staff are walking through Harvard Yard and there's a big hole and there's a big sign that says we're looking for the Indian College. So many people, I had to explain the history to this over and over again, and I think the dig in Harvard Yard did more to create an awareness of the history of Harvard than anything I've seen around here. Because we've been saying this for years and years, but the dig really brought it home. <laughs> and people had to go buy it. It was there during commencement. <laughs> Uh, a lot of visit visiting dignitaries had to see it and ask questions about it and learn about the history. I also think it has brought it home to the administration, to tell you the truth, of the, the importance of the history. Uh, and I think that's a big factor that we constantly have to work on is keeping this in the awareness of the institution and the importance of the collaboration. So many students come to Harvard not knowing about Harvard's past. So there's students that don't know about Indian education here at Harvard 
or the founding of the college, the university as a multicultural place in the 17th century, and how important it was to the creation of Harvard and what we know today. In the 18th and 19th century, that history becomes lost, and that's a key history that tells us about the Harvard. And as a Harvard student or someone affiliated with Harvard, it's a story we should know. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Join us next week for another Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation.